I get to do one of these experiment videos in which I do not make fun of the characters' names. You're gonna be shocked. I didn't hate it. The second I read the word in heat, I knew exactly where we were. I knew exactly what was going on. This was Omegaverse. <laughs> I've just never heard anyone describe it as elegant, you know? That's just not a word I would think to you. <laughs> It is quite literally just a more mediocre version of every other fantasy book you have ever read. Hello, hi, welcome. So it's been quite a bit since I've made a reading experiment video. I think the last one I made was the Colleen Hoover video, which was at the end of last year. So it's, it's been a long time. I apologize. I didn't plan to take a big break from making those videos, but life has just been lifing this year so it was kind of unavoidable but today i'm finally going back to my roots uh with a little bit of a twist we're doing something a little bit different this time around i'm gonna be reading two of the most popular romanticy books what is romanticy you may be wondering if you don't know if you don't spend as much time on the internet as i do first of all good for you second of all romanticy stands for romantic fantasy it's pretty self-explanatory it's literally just fantasy books that are heavily romance based so it's less about the fantasy it's more about the romance that's a really really popular Popular genre right now on book talk on bookstagram on booktube a lot of people are reading it I personally would consider fantasy romance to be one of my favorite genres and I know there's a little bit of a debate between what is romanticy and what is fantasy romance if I have followed the discourse enough from what I gather romanticy are books that are more focused on the romance and they just have a little bit of fantasy in them whereas romantic fantasy is more of a fantasy book that has a romance in it so the fantasy comes first and then it's the romance versus the romanticy books it's the romance that comes first and then it's the fantasy elements so that's kind of the way that I've seen people make the distinction between the two I'm more in this category I like my romance and fantasy to be a little bit balanced in the book whereas these books are more heavily based in the romance than they are in the fantasy so that was a mouthful but today I'm gonna be reading two of the most popular books I have seen in this genre this whole video came to being because I started reading one of these books and I had no intention of making this video at all and then I realized I had to talk about it so I've decided to include it in this video and I decided to just read two books in this video instead of five because if I'm being honest with you all I don't think I can force myself anymore to sit through five full books especially when they're fantasy books and they're like usually over 500 pages if there's a chance that I'm not really gonna like the majority of them so I decided to just keep it to two so we can compare and contrast and also specifically with this video um, it was because these two books are the most popular ones that I've seen everywhere everybody talks about them and I really wanted to know why people were so obsessed. I wanted to do a little bit of investigative journalism for myself, if you can call this that, and just see what it is that has made both of these books just completely blow up, skyrocket to the top of the New York Times bestsellers list, and just sell like crazy, and just create cult followings in such a short amount of time. Before we get into talking about the books, I do want to thank today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different classes that can help foster your creativity. They have classes on a myriad of different topics, including including illustration, photography, animation, music, film and video, social media, and so, so much more. If you're interested in learning the basics of animation or how to grow a social media following, Skillshare will have a class for that. The class I'm actually taking right now is one taught by one of my all-time favorite authors, Sabah Tahir, and it's a class entirely on how to write realistic characters. And writing is something I've really gotten more into this year and something I really want to work on. So taking a class taught by an author I really look up to, admire, and respect has been so worthwhile, and I'm so excited to continue working on it. I feel like I've learned so much from this class already, and it's been so helpful with my own writing. So it's making me more excited to work on my own projects and try out other classes to see how much more I can learn. So if you're interested in trying out Skillshare for yourself, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So again, thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And without any further ado, let's get into talking about the two most popular romantic books that I read and what I think of them. All right, so first up, I read the one, the only, Fourth Wing. This book has been everywhere. I don't even need to tell you about it, you have seen it. Whether by choice or against your will, you have seen this book everywhere. You cannot go on Instagram, TikTok, BookTube, 
anywhere in any book space or in any bookstore and not see this book. It is quite literally inescapable. From what I understand, this is the author's debut into fantasy, but before this she primarily wrote romance novels and erotica, and she seems to have a very long backlist of books, so she's clearly a seasoned writer. But this book, from what I can tell, mostly took off, one, because it did definitely have a marketing budget behind it. I saw a lot of promoted posts for this book to begin with when it was first starting to blow up, and then I think it just had one of those miraculous viral TikTok videos where someone recommended it, and it just kind of blew up and then everyone started picking it up from there. So I think that's kind of how it started to get the attention that it was getting. So I was super curious to see what I was going to think of this. I really did not expect much at all. I didn't think I was going to hate it. I didn't think I'd necessarily be obsessed with it either. I just wanted to see what everyone was talking about because the way people talk about this book, it's like it's life altering. And I know a lot of people when they recommend it, preface it by saying, is it the greatest thing ever written? No, but I had such a fantastic time reading it. I've heard that time and time again in recommendation videos that people have made for it. But what is this book actually about? Fourth Wing is a fantasy novel set in a world that is kind of war torn and we follow around our main character, Violet, who is attending a war college, which is basically just a military school where she is being trained to become a soldier and potentially, hopefully, a dragon rider. The tagline for this book is literally graduate or die, which I honestly find so funny. I don't think it's supposed to be that funny. Maybe it is, um, but to me it's hilarious. <laughs> I feel like that would make a fantastic tagline for a dark academia book, like something that's legitimately criticizing academia or something. I think that would be so funny, but that's not what this book is doing. <laughs> it basically just chronicles our main character's first year at this war college and the love triangle she's in. That's pretty much the whole book. Will she survive this cutthroat school and make it or will she die? So I have finished reading Fourth Wing. Why is this book so popular? You might be wondering. Having finished it, I think I have a partial answer for you, but mostly I also just have to say I don't know. There's no reason for this to be as popular as it is because it is quite literally just a more mediocre version of every other fantasy book you have ever read. I know that sounds really harsh. I don't think this book is horrible. I really don't. I just don't think it's very good either. And while I don't hate it or anything, it definitely doesn't deserve the hype that it's getting because it's just, it's not some new exceptional thing. It's not even just like a really good version of a story you already really know and love. It's just every single YA dystopian, YA fantasy, adult fantasy, new adult fantasy you've ever read. Think of every single trope that's in all of those books you've ever read and they are all in this book except they're just not nearly as interesting. So I think that the appeal of this has truly just been the fact that it is so familiar and so there's this element of like comfort and nostalgia that comes along with reading it. I think that's appealing to people and I can understand that. I just don't get why it's so intense, like why the love for this is so intense when it's not even a good version of those stories you already know, you know? Like this book is quite literally a combination of Akatar, Throne of Glass, From Blood and Ash, Divergent, a little bit of The Hunger Games, which I hesitate saying because that's disrespectful to The Hunger Games, and like pretty much every other YA fantasy. There are elements of every other YA fantasy. It reads so much like an early 2010s YA fantasy book, but it's a new adult fantasy. This is actually very much a thing with I think a lot of books that get really popular on Book Talk, which I think makes sense because the demographic there, at least when Book Talk was first blowing up, was people who had just started reading, who had just gotten back into reading after not reading for a long time. And if you haven't read a lot of YA fantasy, I think you'd like this book because it's gonna seem newer and more exciting to you. But if you have read a couple of YA fantasy series, this is just like those. This is a book for people who don't read a lot. I think that's the thing with a lot of TikTok books, like books that really, really blow up on BookTok, because they're pulling from very commonly used tropes. So if you've read a lot, I don't think you're going to necessarily appreciate this in the same way as somebody who either this is just their favorite genre and they only want to read things in this genre that feel exactly like everything else they've ever read, which not judging you for that, I totally get it, or for people who don't read very much at all. It'll seem interesting or innovative if you don't have a lot of reading experience experience behind you so you don't have exposure to a lot of these stories already and these tropes already, but if you do, I don't think you're gonna be as obsessed with this. I mean, I could be wrong. Plenty of people like it who also read hundreds of books a year, but I'm just saying generally speaking, this is definitely a book for people who don't read that much. You can tell in the way that it's written, in the stories it's borrowing from, and the overused tropes that are in this, which 
I'm a trope girl. I love good tropes, okay? But when you just see them being used again and again, especially in this way that doesn't offer anything new or anything different or unique, and it doesn't even have to be different. Like, I'm not looking for uniqueness in every single book that I read. Just if it's done well, you know, that's what I'm looking for. And for me, this was just not done very well. I mean, I just compared it to pretty much every YA fantasy and dystopian that I don't like. So the chances of me liking this were not as high. But if you like any of those books, you'll probably like this too. Just know that it's just another version of those books. So if you love Divergent, if you love From Blood and Ash, if you love Throne of Glass and A Court of Thorns and Roses, you'll probably love this. If you don't like those books, some things about this are better than some things about those some of those books, but overall I don't think you're really gonna like it either. You may give it like three stars and think it was okay, but like overall I don't think you're gonna love it. It's like when you read a ton of fan fiction about the same couple over and over again and you never get bored of it because you just love them so much so you'll read about them falling in love in a thousand different ways, but then you read one that's just like the exact same tropes as all the other ones that you've been reading that you loved, but this one was just like kind of mediocre compared to those. That's how I think about it. Anyway, my overview or general thoughts aside, let's get into my personal thoughts and the specifics of why I didn't really vibe with this. First and foremost, I just want to say I went into this expecting kind of nothing. I didn't expect to love it because one, it was blurbed by Jennifer L. Armentrout on the cover and we all know how I feel about From Blood and Ash. And two, I don't have that much faith that I'm going to love most popular book talk books. Just the track record, it's, you know, it hasn't been good. So I didn't have high hopes, but I didn't think I would was gonna hate it. I was just truly curious why so many people were so interested in this book and why it's everywhere. Like why is it as popular as it is? I really wanted to answer that question for myself and I had no intention of making this video. Like I wasn't even gonna talk about the book until I started reading it. So first let's start with like the positives that I have to say because I do actually have a few things about this that I did like. I genuinely enjoyed the dragons because you know me, I love dragons in fantasy. They're like one of my favorite elements in fantasy books. If there's a fantasy book with dragons, I will want to read it. So that was definitely a big appeal for me and the dragons were easily, like easily the best part of this book by far. A lot of it reminded me of like Manon in Throne of Glass with the wyverns and that was my favorite part of the Throne of Glass series, like actually the only part of the Throne of Glass series I truly liked by the end. <laughs> but the second thing I did genuinely enjoy was the disability rep in this book. Our main character has some kind of chronic illness. They never really name it specifically but after doing some research and looking into the author I know that she's definitely writing from like first-hand experience as somebody who also deals with a chronic illness and I found it to be pretty well done. It felt genuinely you in and it felt like it was being written from the perspective of someone who does truly understand which is something I feel like I'm always looking for when I'm reading about specific rep. It's just nice to have like a fantasy book where the main character actually has a disability and it's acknowledged and it's not vilified in some way. I mean she definitely deals with like a good bit of ableism and like a lot of bad things that people will say to her but obviously the book doesn't have that perspective. So those were the two things I actually enjoyed about this. If we'd focused more on the dragons and not necessarily on Violet's disability but on Violet as a person more so than just like a mouthpiece to give us world building information and also just part of this romance that I did not care about. I feel like I would have enjoyed the book a little bit more if we'd gotten more like political intrigue and did some world building and delved into that a little bit more and had more dragons because I will always want more dragons. But yeah, those are the things, the elements of the story that I found to be genuinely enjoyable, but unfortunately that did not outweigh the negatives for me. So First and foremost, the thing I think this book suffers from more than anything is a lack of world building. This world makes no sense. Like absolutely zero sense. And it is so clear when you're reading the book that it is not thought out. And I get it, when you're reading like a fantasy romance, you're not reading for the plot. You're not reading for the world. You're reading for the romance, like that's what you're here for. But when you're trying to make a book that is going to be, from what I understand, the first in like a very long series that includes a lot of like world politics and it's supposed to be really action packed and like super high stakes because this world is very intense and like cutthroat and deadly, you need to expand the world a little bit because it's so illogical that it was hard to read sometimes. <laughs> and for a while, I feel like I was gaslighting myself being like, I'm probably just thinking about this too hard. Like I'm, I'm reading too much into it, but I really don't think I was because can anyone explain to me why Violet is in a war college? Like that's what it's called. She's like in a, in a military academy basically where they're being trained to go off to fight in a war. What is this war for? Do they explain it? a little bit, but like not really. <laughs> They're just being trained as soldiers and she's kind of forced into this war college by her mom. At this college, they're just 
killing off people every single day. Like if you don't make it, you're not gonna make it into the actual military. They just kill you off. There's like a death count, a death toll every day. It's kind of like in the Hunger Games where they would like announce the deaths at the end of every single day during the games. They do like the same thing. That's why I compare it to that in some ways. And it's like super deadly. Like there are people dying left and right constantly. Why are they killing off people that they could be using for their actual military. That that just doesn't seem effective. Also, what are the politics of this world? Why are we fighting this war? What is the war for? Who are the two sides? They kind of start to explain it by the end, but like not not really and not clear enough. So it's really confusing what's going on and it's not because it's a fantasy book and you're kind of confused. It's because it's not well described. It's just it's not well thought out. It's not well explored. It's not well built because there's like no world building. You get all of the world building through either Violet or other characters just like spewing random facts at you at really inconvenient times. Like they should be talking about other things but all of a sudden they're just like telling you well back in this age this happened and that happened and then that happened and then this happened. It's really info dumpy sometimes Sometimes, um, but you're really still not getting any info, which is confusing. Along with that, in terms of the world building, I was very confused on the time period we were set in in this book. I know it's a fantasy world, so it's like fictional. It didn't make a lot of sense because the women wear corsets. The word thrice was used at least once. That might have been in context of like an old book they were reading, but I don't remember exactly. It was like at the beginning. But then we also use words like clusterfuck. So... Um, I'm not really sure where we are in time and space. <laughs> the other thing about it that I feel like didn't help with the world building element and made it feel underdeveloped and also just made the book feel very oddly paced was the fact that we had just like so many time jumps. The book takes place over the span of like about a year, I think, and it just jumps in time constantly. Sometimes it'll be like a month passed and like nothing happened. And then it's like three months later and like nothing happened in between that time. So we're just like skipping through a lot of what I feel like is essential to, you know, building the world in which our story is set. It was odd in that sense. The pacing was really, really weird to me. It made the book read very fast paced, which is another reason I think that people really enjoyed this. It's so fast paced. It took me forever to read it because I was bored, but the book itself is fast paced. So you will get through it pretty quickly. There are definitely sections that are way more interesting than other sections. Sometimes there's like nothing going on for so long and then suddenly everything is happening all at once. And I honestly feel like nothing was going on forever in this book until the very very end. It was like really low stakes despite the fact that someone's like dying on every other page which also you just like don't care that they're dying because you don't know them. Anyway pretty much nothing is going on for the majority of the book and then we like bond with the dragons. We learn about the dragons and everything. That's a little bit interesting. I was into it at that point. Then it gets really boring again and then at the very end all of a sudden we go from doing nothing. Suddenly it's all out war. Like all out war. I don't know if other people felt this way when they read it, but that scene, like that whole ending sequence, which I think a lot of people really liked because the ending was very high stakes, very action packed, and there was just so much movement, so much going on. I think people like it a lot because it's so involved, but I felt like it was really, really convoluted. The choreography of this fight made no sense. It was like we were jumping from one place to another with no explanation. I couldn't visualize it. Usually when I'm reading a book or like a fight scene or something, Sometimes it's a little confusing to visualize, but you can kind of like grasp where you're at. I had no idea what was going on that entire fight. Along with all of that, this book was, like I mentioned earlier, because it was so similar to every other YA fantasy book I've ever read, it was so predictable. There was not a single thing, like I swear to you, not one single plot twist or event that happened in this book that I did not predict. Every single one of them, and that's not me being smart, it's just because I've read the books that this book is based off of. <laughs> if you have read those books, you know where this book is gonna go. Like it's not, it's it's not gonna be some new thing. You know, I was just sitting there constantly rolling my eyes. I was like, okay, so then this is gonna happen. And then it happened. And I was like, okay, so then that's gonna happen. And then it happened. So, you know, <laughs> maybe this is on me because like I have read a lot of other YA fantasies. So I'm used to seeing this all the time. So like I, I need to branch out and read other things, which I feel like I do, but I still love the YA fantasy genre. And I know this is not YA. I know everyone's gonna get mad at me for calling it YA. YA. I don't care. Besides the sex in this book, it's a YA book. It reads exactly like every other YA book. It doesn't read like a lot of new adult books actually, which is not like something I'm knocking it for. I love YA fantasy. It's truly one of my favorite genres, but this reads like a YA fantasy. The other thing we do have to touch on, the names. <laughs> when will I get to do one of these experiment videos in which I do not make fun of the characters' names? Because in this book, 
The main character's name, her name is Violet, which that's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with the name Violet, but her last name is Sorengale. Mm. <laughs> it is thankfully not spelled like Soaring, like S-O-A-R, and then Gale as in G-A-L-E. It is S-O-R-R-E-N-G-A-I-L, I think. I can't remember exactly the spelling, but it's it's not that exact, but it's close enough. And I found that to be a little embarrassing, <laughs> a little cringe. It was just a little too on the nose for my taste, personally. It's not nearly as bad as Lily Blossom Bloom or America Singer, but Sword and Gale is kind of close. For a dragon rider, it's a little too much. <laughs> and then the main love interest's name, which is bad for very different reasons, is Zayden Ryerson, spelled with an X. And like, listen, am I getting petty? Maybe. But I just hate that name. That name sounds like the main character of a Colleen Hoover novel. Like that's the same thing as like Ryo Kincaid or Ledger Ward. Like it's just the fantasy version of that because you spelled it with an X instead of a Z. Zayden Ryerson is a bad name. I'm so sorry. I'm like not even sorry. It's a bad name. <laughs> I'd literally rather take a Sarah J Mass name like Resant or Kale or Tamlin. Like those are better names than Zayden Ryerson. So while we're on the topic of the two main characters, the romance is a thing we have to talk about because that's what everyone's reading this book for. Uh, it was fine. I don't hate the romance. I don't actually hate anything about this book. There's one thing I do hate, which we'll get to. I didn't care about the romance. And if I don't care about the romance, I'm not gonna care about a fantasy romance book because like that's the whole reason you're reading the book. <laughs> Nothing about Zayden was interesting to me. Nothing about Violet was that interesting to me. I will say I did not actually really hate Violet. She was not as annoying as a lot of main characters in fantasy novels can be female characters because sometimes they just write like the worst, the worst main female character you've ever read about. And she She's like such a pick me and it's so annoying. Violet wasn't like that. I didn't hate her at all. I definitely liked her more than Zayden. She was a lot less YN than some of the main characters in a lot of those fantasy novels. So I did appreciate that. The romance itself, like there was just really nothing there for me. I can get why people might like it. I just didn't find it that interesting or unlike anything I'd ever read before. And again, just like a watered down version of things I've already seen. There were a couple of things about it that were like kind of cringe to me, specifically the fact that his nickname for her is violence, which just kind of doesn't actually make any sense because she's not violent and that's the whole point. And like, I don't know if that's why he calls her, there's no reason he calls her violence. He just calls her violence. It's supposed to be cute for some reason. I don't know, I'm not really a pet name person. So like, I don't really like that very much. I'm not a nickname person. And then there was one specific line that I wrote down that I just found to be so, so cringy, which is at the very, very end, um, but it's not a spoiler. And it's something that Zayden says, and he literally says, and I quote, she exists and I get turned on, <laughs> which was a lot. <laughs> Like, it's kind of funny, but it wasn't supposed to be funny. That's the thing. I feel like if this book was a little bit more comedic and if that was said in more of like a humorous way, even if he was serious, if it was said in more of a humorous way, I feel like it would have been fine. It would have been funnier, but he was like dead serious. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and then the very last thing that I want to talk about, the thing that like, before this happened, I was like, this is fine. Like, I don't really get why people love this so much, but it's okay. Like, max, I'd give this book three stars. It's like, whatever. I Like, it's not for me, but I can understand. It's just, it's okay. And then this happened, and then I was like, no, <laughs> I've had enough. I don't like this book. And so from there, it was like very much downhill. And this is unfortunately kind of in the middle of the book. So I did not enjoy a good bit of it because this happened kind of soon. And that's because we introduced a little sprinkle of Omegaverse into this story. So to talk about this, I'm gonna have to talk very lightly about a spoiler. It's not a very like serious spoiler, but if you don't wanna hear anything about this book at all in any way, I'm gonna leave a picture of the book cover on the screen. So you can mute me until um, the cover is gone and then you can come back and listen and I'll be done talking about the spoiler. But again, it's a very light spoiler. Like it's not actually anything related to the plot, but if you don't wanna be spoiled, just mute me for now. So in this world, people bond with dragons, right? So when you bond with your dragon you can feel everything that your dragon is feeling like all of their emotions they can communicate telepathically and so when you're bonded with your dragon you can feel physically when they're in pain you can feel emotionally when they're going through something and so violet's dragon is mated with another dragon one night she wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat feeling overcome by lust <laughs> and i think you know where i'm going with this her dragon is with it's mate doing things. And she wakes up 
And they quite literally describe it as she felt like a cat in heat. And the second I read the word in heat, I knew exactly where we were. I knew exactly what was going on. This was Omegaverse, <laughs> okay? Yes, they get turned on when their dragons are turned on. And so of course, she's just like overcome with these feelings and then happens, happens to coincidentally, which that was another thing. There were so many coincidences in this book where she would just happen to find Zayden somewhere or happen to run into him. It's impossible for there to be that many coincidences. It was just constantly happening. She'd always run into him. But anyway, of course she like runs into him in that moment and she's like throwing herself at him because she's in heat because her dragon is in heat. And that was the thing that just like drove me over the edge. I was like, I've had enough. I don't, I don't need to be here for this anymore. That's, I'm done. You're probably wondering to yourself, Hannah, does this mean you have read Omegaverse fanfiction? I hate to admit this online, but yes, I have unfortunately read, I, I've read one Omegaverse fanfiction because I did not know what the Omegaverse was. And then I, I read it out of sheer curiosity because I was like, what is this? This was like in 2019, I think. I read it out of sheer curiosity and now I know everything about the Omegaverse. Unfortunately, I know too much about the Omegaverse, but I am kind of grateful that I did read that fan fiction sometimes because now when I read books I can spot when the author has either read or written Omegaverse fan fiction because it's so obvious when you know the signs you can spot them from a mile away and without a doubt this author has either read or written Omegaverse fan fiction. Did not need that element in this it was definitely my least favorite part of the book. <laughs> it did unfortunately kind of ruin the dragons for me. It was very upsetting. <laughs> but that pretty much covers all of my thoughts on Fourth Wing. If you're considering reading this book, this is my recommendation. If you like Divergent, Throne of Glass, Akatar, or From Blood and Ash, and you want something that's just like those books where you don't have to think about what's gonna happen next because it's all basically exactly the same thing as those books combine, read it, you'll probably like it. If you don't like those books very much and you don't like a lot of the tropes and elements that are in those books very much, I don't think you need to spend your time reading this book. I don't think you're really gonna get much out of it. That's my guess. Obviously I cannot say every person's gonna be different, but generally speaking, if you're more in the side of people who enjoy these books, you'll like Fourth Wing. If you are not, you probably won't like Fourth Wing because it's just like all of them. So that's my personal recommendation. I'm not gonna tell you to read it or don't read it. It is up to you if you decide to read it. These are just my thoughts. Personally, I gave this book two out of five stars. Again, I don't hate it. I just don't think it's very good. It's kind of like the way I felt about Akatar. I did not hate Akatar. I just don't think it's very good, but that's all there is to say about that. So on to the next book to see how that one fares. <laughs> All right, so the next book I read was The Serpent and the Wings of Night. This was a book I saw a ton at the beginning of this year on TikTok and on Instagram. Everyone seemed to be reading and recommending this, saying that it was even better than Akatar, which I know I'm not an Akatar fan, so this book is definitely meant for fans of Sarah J Mass and that series specifically, but I kept seeing it everywhere and so many people were saying it's so much better than that series, it's just so so good. Everyone has to read it. It's some of the best romanticy out there. And again, this is another book that I knew absolutely nothing about before I went into it other than seeing everyone's praise for it, apart from the fact that it's about vampires. I'm coming to you. I think sitting in exactly the same spot I was sitting in when I was talking about Fourth Wing. It would seem like I haven't moved, um, except it's been like a whole month since I read that book and it took me a whole month to read this one. I feel like that might give you an idea of where this is gonna go. <laughs> I have my green juice because a girl needed energy and my sweater just felt extremely appropriate. I literally just basically crawled out of bed to film this. That just, it feels like the right way to talk about this book, I think. <laughs> so, The Serpent of Wings and Night. The Serpent of the Wings and Night? I'm still unsure about the number of articles in this title. I don't know how many thes there are. Okay, The Serpent and the Wings of Night. That is what it's called. That's the title. I read The Serpent of the Wings and Night. It, did I say it right? I still don't know. <laughs> I posted that I was reading this book on my Instagram story and um, this was after I'd already posted about reading Fourth Wing and several people were saying they liked it more than Fourth Wing so they were curious to see what I was gonna think but they thought that I might like it a little bit more too. I will start off this whole review by saying I think you were kind of right. I do like this a little bit more than Fourth Wing which is not a high bar, but I do like it a little bit more than Fourth Wing. I just think it's more interesting overall. Um, and there's like less military propaganda. All I really knew about this before getting into it was that I think it's inspired, heavily inspired by the Akatar series. And you can tell that this book is definitely inspired by that series. However, I do still think it's actually 
very different. I think this is more similar to From Blood and Ash than it is to Akatar in a lot of ways, but it also has kind of that Hunger Games divergent dystopian element to it where there's some kind of competition and there are tributes. But I think, as was the case with Fourth Wing, it's kind of just the same things we've seen before, reused and recycled without any kind of new commentary or any innovation or anything new to add to the conversation. It's basically what you've seen before except a little bit more boring. I don't know, it's like being transported back into 2010 YA fantasy and dystopian, except they rely entirely on the fact that you feel nostalgic for that time in your life. But what is The Serpent and the Wings of Night about? Did I say that right? I still don't know. <laughs> anyway, what is this book about? One of my main questions while I was reading this book was, what is this book about? Because it was really confusing because there's like no world building. I will say though, there's more world building in this book, or at least better world building in this book than there is in Fourth Wing. But the bar in that was really, really, really low, like astronomically low. This one wasn't that much better, it was just definitely better. Bear with me, I really don't understand this universe at all and I'm trying my best. <laughs> From what I could grasp, this takes place in a fantasy world where vampires exist and vampires exist kind of alongside humans but they have power over humans and they are taking over their cities and destroying them and killing off humanity basically. But the vampires are also at war with each other based on different houses and so there's conflict within the vampire houses as well. So we follow our main character whose name I literally don't remember even though I finished this book yesterday. <laughs> Oriah, her name is Oriah. Our main character Oriah is a human, but she was adopted as a child. She was adopted by the king of the vampires, Vincent. Like that's all I know about him. His name is Vincent. He's the king of the vampires and he's kind of ruthless. He adopts her when she's young. And so we're getting her story when she's now, I think like 21 or 22 years old. So she's basically just this human girl living in the vampire world who wants, I don't I don't think to be turned into a vampire, but somehow kind of be turned into a vampire. I'm a little unclear on exactly what she wanted, but I know she doesn't want to fully stay human. So she enters this competition, which I'm also kind of unclear on what this competition is exactly. I know that the prize is that the winner, like the victor, literally called the victor, of this competition basically gets like a wish granted to them. And she and her father, Vincent, want her to win and want her to get this wish, but she's human and humans don't enter this competition. It's like a vampire competition. So she's like the only human in this entire competition with all of these other vampires. Again, I'm unclear on what the competition is exactly. I just know people are killing each other. I don't really know why, they just are. That's just kind of how it is. <laughs> I am also confused on how she is so strong even though she's human. We do kind of get an answer to that at the end, but I'm kind of confused on why nobody else is that confused about how she could possibly keep up with vampires on this level. You know, it's it's not very clear. Anyway, doesn't matter. Araya enters this competition and in this competition is where she meets our main male love interest. Rain, I think his name is Rain, but it's spelled in like that very Sarah J Mass way with like too many extra letters and it's just confusing. <laughs> anyway, Rain is a vampire and they're competitors in this competition, so it's a little bit like enemies to lovers. Yeah, that's kind of like generally what this book is about. The book gives you a content warning at the very beginning, which I very much appreciated. I thought that was really nice that they do tell you that. And there's definitely some pretty heavy stuff in this book. One of the main themes of the story's essay. So just know that if you decide to read it, uh, do read the content warning before hand, but that is a major theme in this story. So if it's not something you're comfortable reading, probably skip this one. So I do think that this book is a bit darker than something like Fourth Wing. Fourth Wing definitely reads a lot more like YA, like I mentioned in the review for it. This one does read more like your classic new adult. So if you were to compare this book to any book that has good world building, it has garbage world building, okay? The world building is not good. It doesn't make any sense. It's just not even there. But if you were to compare it to something like Fourth Wing and From Blood and Ash, there is some world building there, so I have to give it some credit. It's more along the lines of something like Akatar that definitely had a little bit more thought put into the actual politics and world of the story versus those other books that had like no thought put into those. So it wasn't good world building, but it was better than some of these other books that I didn't like. I will say I would give this book a little bit more leeway because from what I understand, this book is self-published. And when something is self-published, it didn't go through all the processes and all of the different people that a traditionally published book goes through. Several, several rounds of editing. You don't know how many times 
times the author edited the book. So for a book that's self-published, I can be a little bit more lenient on it with how repetitive the story was, which was definitely one of my grievances with this book. I'm not gonna look at it the same way that I will look at something like Fourth Wing, which was traditionally published and also extremely repetitive. They had more chances to fix that. A self-published author doesn't have the same resources to do that. Anyway, the book was very repetitive. There were certain phrases, specifically every time the main male love interest would talk about the female character, he would always say that she's making some face. He's like, there's that face again. There she is. There's that face again. Oh, your expression. You should see the expression on your face. Like, I can't count the number of times that was said. It was excessive, like really excessive. And so there was stuff like that in the book where it was just same phrases and sentences being used over and over again, same descriptions and descriptors being used for characters over and over again. So there wasn't a lot of variety in the language that was being used. That did make it a little bit tedious to read sometimes. That also makes it a lot quicker to read. It, it kind of reads more like fan fiction in that sense. Another thing that this book kind of suffered from was the pacing. Again, I you know I keep comparing it to Fourth Wing, but that was the point of this video to read these two books to see if I liked either of them, um, and it turns out I don't really like either of them because they're both kind of just the same thing. And one of the same issues I had in both of them was the pacing, and the pacing in this one was also kind of horrible. I highlighted this one thing that I feel like perfectly emphasizes what the uh, pacing of this book was actually like. So there's just this section, this one um, section where they're talking about like training together, her and Rain. The narration literally just says, so we trained and we bickered. And that is exactly how this book is paced. That is how so much of the action of this book is explained. So many things in this book are just like, this happened and then that happened. Now we jump forward this much in time. And like, that's it. That's like the only explanation they give you. So it, that's why the world building makes no sense. So that was personally just one of the biggest issues for me. Other thing I will touch on, uh, the smut in this book, you're gonna be shocked. I didn't hate it. I genuinely didn't hate it. I truly think that of all the smut I've read in all of these romanticy books, like Fourth Wing, Akatar, uh, From Blood and Ash, all those types of books, this one by far had the best smut. Did I love it? No, but I didn't hate it. There was just one thing that I want to point out that I just thought was funny. Besides that, I thought it was pretty fine. I like it was just it was completely fine. And I don't really have much to say. I do want to read this line to you. And I want you to guess what she is talking about and what she's describing because out of context, I just think it sounds so funny. <laughs> I didn't know it was possible to find such a thing so stunning, like a work of art. It was as big and powerful as the rest of him. Actually, the size of it made me faintly nervous. And yet it was also so elegant, every shade of flesh exquisitely complimentary, the head peeking from a graceful sweep of tan skin. Yeah. <laughs> I've just never heard anyone describe it as elegant, you know? That's just not a word I would think to use. <laughs> but besides that, I honestly, I have no qualms with it. <laughs> the relationship in this book was also kind of just okay. There's some stuff that happens at the end, some like twists and things that I didn't entirely see coming, but wasn't all that unexpected to me at the same time. And I just found the end of this book to be really weird. It was really, really rushed. Like the last, I want to say, 100 pages of this book or so is where kind of all of the actual action happens, where things start to make a little bit of sense, where the relationship between the characters develops, and then you feel some kind of investment. But then it gets like really, really fast. Like everything happens really fast. Like they don't even kiss for like 250 pages or something. And the book was only like, my ebook's like 400 pages or something like that. So it's like halfway through, more than halfway through the book, and they don't even like touch each other really. And then from like that point on, from like the last hundred pages or so, it's just non-stop action. And it's just like twist after twist after twist after twist with like no, nothing in between. It just gets a little bit jarring and overwhelming. And so I found the pacing at the end to be quite odd. And it just made the whole ending of the book a little bit odd. I don't think the actual events that happened were necessarily bad or all that weird. It was just too much too fast. It felt like a lot of that needed to happen sooner in the story or we needed to tone it down a little bit at the end and save some of that for the next book. I also was under the impression that this was a standalone book, but from what I gather, I think there's at least one more book and potentially like 
a whole series, but I think there might just be one more book. I won't be reading it. I'm not interested enough to keep reading it, but I feel like the second book would probably be a bit more interesting than the first one was because I feel like there's just more to do now. But that is pretty much all I have to say about this book. I didn't think about it a lot. There were definitely some moments where I felt like I was actually enjoying it. I felt something for the characters and I was trying to just suspend my disbelief and, you know, have a good time, not think about it very deeply. But at the same time, there are just so many elements in this that are just not for me in terms of the world building and the story structure and the characters and the tropes and everything. It's just not my thing. I want to love romanticy as a genre. I feel like I, I do. I feel like I should. It's just what's currently popular, like the most popular obviously, in this genre is in my opinion, not even close to what the best romanticy could be. I understand that people don't want like heavy world building and politics in their fantasy romance because they're reading it for the romance. But if you don't have some of that, the story is much less believable. The characters are a lot less believable. If they live in an extremely unrealistic world, how are you supposed to believe that these characters are realistic in any way? If the circumstances of their lives are completely unrealistic because you didn't spend the time to think about the structure of the world that you've created and the politics and the dynamic of it. So if that's not there, the characters don't come to life either. So that's why I feel like I need a better balance of those things in order to actually feel an investment in the relationship between the characters. So yeah, that's kind of all I have to say on um, the Serpent of the Wings and Night. I think, I think I got it right that time. <laughs> I did like this a little bit more than Fourth Wing, like I said. I think I'd give this like 2.5 out of 5 stars. I still feel like I'm being kind of generous with these ratings. Like these are not good books to me. Like I don't like them. They don't rank very high for me at all. They're not one star books because it's not the worst, worst thing I've ever read, but it's not up there either. So we're gonna go with like around a two to two and a half. I think I gave Fourth Wing a two, so we'll give this one a two and a half. I might change that, but that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. They're not horrifying, but they're also not good. So do with that what you will, but my personal recommendation, try something else. I don't really think this is worth your time. But there you all have it. That is it for my thoughts on Fourth Wing and The Serpent and the Wings of Night. This is far from the most difficult or agonizing experiment video I've had to make, partially because I only read two books, which I think helped a little bit, but also because they weren't like horrific. If you're just trying to have like a good time and you really, like you really don't want to think at all, like absolutely no thoughts, head empty, um, Maybe you'll like it. <laughs> Personally, I don't think they're worth the hype. In terms of the writing, the character development, the world building, you know, just the building blocks of the craft of writing, it's just not there <laughs> with these two books. Which is why I, I feel kind of confused sometimes when books like this get so, so popular because I feel like those are things that are foundational to a good book and these books didn't really have it. Anyway, that is it for this video. I do plan to make some more reading experiment videos, but if there are any specific videos you would like to see, please do let me know in the comments down below. I have a couple more planned, but I'm more than happy to take your suggestions as well. I'm not sure if I will do the same thing where I'll only read like two or three books or if I'll go back to reading five. It kind of depends on the length of the books, but this one just felt right comparing these two. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media, all of my links are in the description box as always, but thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!